Look at fans, welcome back. And and welcome back to our listeners that uh you know can't can't handle can't stand us for more than uh four months out of the year. Uh we appreciate you coming back into the fold for for basketball season. It's Zach Miller and Peter Hale. It's the Midtown Madness Podcast. Before we get going, again, thank you all so much for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like and subscribe button. Check out our show over on YouTube. I think there's a you know, it's a. I think it's more entertaining. Honestly, that's my opinion. Um, it's season five once again. The Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by Two Men in a Garden. Pete, I say it all the time. Every time I watch a YouTube video, I watch too much YouTube, and I see these ads for the most insane things that get you locked into a subscription model. All this stuff, and I'm I, no, no, I don't. I, I we tried, you know having a product on the last podcast, but uh, no useless subscription services. Uh, no, um, you know, no dumb little trinkets uh, to sell here. All we are about is two men in a garden salsa. It's local. It tastes amazing. They've got all the flavors to suit your individual salsa preferences. You can pick up their many products at any local grocery store or online at two men in a garden.com. If you're particular about your salsa, that's where you want to go. Uh, you can follow them as well on social media at Two Men Salsa on Instagram and Twitter. Pete, uh, we are uh, we are back. It is it, basketball season starts. You know what? I'm I'm seriously jealous of the listeners. Uh, more so, usually I feel bad for them because they listen. They have to listen to us. Uh, but right now, I feel really. I'm just really uh, jealous because they are closer to Billiken basketball than we are right now. That's right, Zach. We got to make sure this one goes out on time because uh, hey, I we, took off for you people. We, I took we, PTO <laughs> just to get this episode out. We've got a uh, we've got a little preview coming up. We've got the season starting as you're listening today, so you're gonna want to have to give this a listen before the Santa Clara game this afternoon. Uh, Zach, I couldn't be more excited. I cannot wait to get a look at this team in live game action. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I think at, at bare minimum, this team is gonna be uh, what has tried to be advertised to us for the last eight years. Uh, this team is gonna be v- play fast offensively. Uh, whether that transitions uh, to a ra- well rounded basketball team uh, remains to be seen. I I I think both of us think it it, it will. Uh, but I, I could not be more excited. This is uh, probably the most palpable excitement that I have experienced regarding Billiken basketball uh, in, in a long time, probably since the NCAA tournament. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's it's absolute, It's like Christmas Eve over here at MMPHQ. It really is. It really is. I, I just, it's, it, it felt like it would never get here. And now we're here. And, it's just uh, weird. It's weird. It's like, I know. it's going to be weird looking on that, like as the camera pans left and right, mm-hmm. looking at the sideline, it's, it's different. Uh, certainly it's, it's probably improved. Uh, I, I don't think I even need to add probably it's definitely improved. Uh, the vibes are high, man. The vibes are high. The, the The potential is high. I yes. think there's a there's a wide range of outcomes for this team this season, but I think um, you know certainly pointed in the right direction. And I'm I'm cautiously optimistic with this team for sure. Uh, and w- another thing, Zach, we're going to be you know we're going to be live tweeting, watching this game. Yeah, you know, so so be sure and follow us. You know, at Midtown Mad Pod on 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 X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're definitely going to be up there. Uh, I, I hear West Pine Bills is going to be doing a post game spaces, so uh, we're probably going to be able to pop in there for a little bit too. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a great that may turn into day. a live watch of the women's game. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, well, we've got uh, we've got a guest here. I think I think it's we're getting somebody who has been in the trenches. Uh, with Billiken basketball embedded like Ollie North with St. Louis University uh, Athletics. And that's Stu Durando. Uh, we interviewed him, and we're just going to kick it over there right now because 
Uh, he is really putting out a ton of uh, written content uh, on Substack. I hate calling it content, uh, but he's putting out some well-written blogs, uh, really getting deep into the weeds as it pertains to Billiken basketball. So we talked to him. This is the interview right now. Billiken fans, we've got a special guest today, uh, Stu Durando. In his over 40-year career covering college sports, he spent 25 years at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and 15 of those years covering SLU. Uh, now he's gone independent with his own Substack, which uh, this is the first I've ever learned about Substack. I had no idea it existed, but um, uh, Stu on SLU. Uh, Stu, welcome to the Midtown Madness podcast. I got to ask you uh, the one thing everybody wants to know. Why is there an anti-SLU conspiracy at the Post-Dispatch? I don't know the anti slew conspiracy. <laughs> but I, I be, I'm happy to hear you out and, and hear whatever your theory is behind it. No, uh, it's just no, just uh, you know, it's a battle what, for space. It's a, it's been a, a you know, in my time and other people's times, it's an ongoing battle for space with everything else going on and the paper shrinking. Yeah, always uh, shrinking. Right. Uh, speaking of it shrinking. Uh, the decision to transition uh, from or to Substack from the Post Dispatch uh, kind of walk us through how uh, that kind of came to be. I guess in the play of like where you were going to continue uh, writing about SLU. Yeah, well, um, it just kind of came out of nowhere because I wasn't planning on going anywhere until they offered buyouts, and then that you know that things got kind of intriguing um quickly and I just had to make a quick decision um I'd really been looking forward to covering this season I so getting out and not being part of the season or doing things was not something I, I considered so I quickly had to think if I'm going to do this how do I stay involved um yeah w w would you know slew allow me to stay involved as some random independent guy and, um, you know, I knew about Substack just like, oh, I know sports writers leave their papers and become Substack writers, but what is this? And so I had to, you know, I did a kind of a cram session on it over a couple of days to see just kind of basically what could be accomplished. Um, had no expectations. I didn't know what may or may not happen in terms of interest, but just thought, okay, if they'll let me keep covering the team, I'm going to do it this way. I'll create this Substack page and uh, hope for the best in terms of uh, generating generating readers. And it it took off pretty well in the first couple of weeks. And and you mentioned SLU and your uncertainty about how they would be with you being uh, you know independent now. I, we did see you know I guess you you tweeted out the picture of your free agent or somebody did the the free agent it said on your uh, press pass. For Shafitz and oh oh yeah uh, on the on the little thing they put at our seat at the table yeah 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 Brian so Cuthbert put that on there <laughs> so um, it see, it seems like Slu has been amicable to the change and they're and they're fine with you being independent and still being there right yeah I told them what I was doing um, what I hoped to do um, and still get access and I talked to um, you know Brian specifically who you know handles the media. And he was great. I told Shirts what I was going to do, and he was great. And um, that was all I needed to hear to to go ahead and just decide to go and do it. So you know, I I was my last day was on a Friday, and then the next Monday morning I launched it and just mm -hmm. said, "What the heck? Let's just get this going." Um, you've you've spent much of your tenure uh, covering SLU, uh, and there's been several coaches uh, over those years. How does Josh Shirts stack up from the perspective of a beat writer? Like, what what about it? You know, makes him special, different. Yeah, different. I would say so. Yeah, I covered I covered Romar, I covered Brad Soderberg, uh, I covered Jim Cruz, Travis Ford, and now Josh Shirts. So five different coaches. Um, all of them, I would say, were good to the media. Um, accessible practices open um available to talk pretty much whenever um some some more than others but and and some were better interviews than others um 
Schertz is uh, unguarded. He's he's very available and he's very open about things. And he tells you when he doesn't want you to use something, but he's just very, um, very open about things and tells you, you know, during the course of a, of a conversation, he'll steer off and, and throw in some little gems that become ideas for stories. And um, he's just very uh, accessible, normal guy. Um, and he's been really good to work with. How, how, what, uh, how has the difference in, you know, things that, aren't to be that are off the record change from the previous kind of regime. If that makes sense. Um, how are off the record things change? Yeah. Like, so, so like say Ford was very coy about injuries. Like yeah. is shirts that coy or like Ford was very open. No, about not this with injuries. Thing, he hasn't been. He's been closed. very open about injuries. Um, Travis would just not tell you things. He was very, he was very guarded. Um, he was good to work with, but he, he protected a lot of things he didn't want to, to talk about. Shirts will talk about things. Um, and he'll just tell you this is off the record and it might be really interesting stuff, but you know, you don't use it. And, um, so, uh, yeah, injury wise, he's been good. Um, Recruiting wise, he's been pretty good. Uh, he's been he's been hitting you with all the nuggets when it comes to recruiting. I mean, at least in those in those first few months, or not yeah, months. during the portal stuff, he, yeah. Yeah, he was very open. Who was coming? Who was visiting? Who who he was canceling visits with? Um, yeah, so it was a, a a pretty open book in terms of what what the scenario was with a lot of guys. What about the rest of the staff? Have you had much interaction with them yet? Yeah, um, they're all pleasant chaps um, um, with different personalities. Uh, Zach, uh, got to say it right, Beauvais, um, very energetic. Um, uh, well, they're all very energetic. And um, what's, inter what's been interesting to watch in practices especially is um, how much the assistant, some of the assistants coach, um, there are times, you know, when it may go 20 minutes and uh, Schertz is on the sideline watching while one of the other guys runs a drill or, you know, teaches a concept or whatever it is, and then just kind of steps in to say what he has to say and then backs off again. So, um, yeah, they've all been, uh, again, they're, they're all accessible as well if I need them. And um, they're all very involved in, in the teaching of the game. They they all seem like I mean not seem they are very uh very cerebral basketball geeks. Yes. Yes, they are nerds. They are basketball nerds. Yeah. Have you had uh one or more times where you're sitting there listening and you're just like I don't I, I don't know what you're what you're saying right now, but I'm gonna go I'm gonna A little bit, yeah. Like I was with Shirts was talking about defense the other day with me and he just started rattling off a description of guarding a ball screen and he put like so much detail into this little piece of time on the court that happens and he was using terms that that I was like I, I didn't even go back and ask him a couple of things but I mean he was just you know trying to point out how intricate one little moment on the court can be and um and and describing what happens with all five guys in this moment and um yeah they're they they like that stuff um, what what about the players you know we've got you know 10 out of 13 scholarship players are new has anybody kind of stood out as being uh, pretty interesting to interview so far um they've all been fairly you know the ones i've talked to have been you know pretty interesting kaluanya um has a great backstory um so you know i haven't talked to all of them one on one i've talked to max Picard, and killian brockoff um uh, Isaiah Swope a little, Robbie Avila for, uh, you know, quite a bit of time, uh, a couple of times. Um, and uh, they're all well-spoken um, and, and good interviews so far. I haven't run across anyone that I want to avoid from here on out. <laughs> and sometimes you do. There are sometimes yeah. you, you come across a guy and you say, please don't bring him to the interview room anymore. Right. <laughs> what is no one like that so far. 
Have you kind of, I mean, obviously I think Jimerson is probably the most interesting case study on this team uh, because he's, he's seeing the second, like he's got a new regime coming in. How has his kind of, has he changed at all uh, between having shirts here and, you know, free shirts? Changed in terms of just demeanor. Yeah, I mean, I don't think know. he's changed since the day he got here. I mean, he's pretty <laughs> much the same. He's just, except he's like ten years older. He's, <laughs> he's pretty much the same same guy. He's he's pretty reserved, um, but he's very thoughtful when you get him in an interview. Um, so he, some might get the impression that he's not a big talker, but he's you know he's really good at explaining things and, and, and telling stories. I have not talked to him at length since the preseason started, just because I knew I probably would right before the season. I hope to do that next week before the home opener and just kind of delve into some stuff with, you know, being around so long and becoming the all time leading scorer here. We assume soon and those types of things, but um, no, he just looks like, you know, he's the business as usual kind of guy. We uh we just got some news in the last few hours actually, and that's um that's about Kobe Johnson uh, being a game time decision due to his shoulder injury. You're you're on the ground there. Have you heard anything else? I don't. I don't know news? that. Yeah. So you guys are scooping me on that. Okay. Um, that, that was, was so. Now well, Goodman scooped it. Yeah, it was it was it was because it's a field of sixty eight event, you know, and and Goodman put that on uh, on Twitter probably just a few hours ago as we oh, speak. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, so yeah, they've got the inside uh, inside angle on all that kind of stuff because they've been around practice probably the last two days. Yeah, what one of the biggest kind of moments of the preseason was obviously the Robbie Avila injury. Uh, what was the? I mean, was the vibe pretty even keel? Because this the staff and team just seems like they kind of there was no panic. Um, we, didn't see any, we didn't see any panic. Um, it was kind of, you know, uh, it happened on the opposite side of the court for me, and Avila was kind of, uh, he immediately sat down and couldn't get up, which seemed a little bit odd that he didn't try and get up and do so. He just kind of sat there, and they were waving people over. But um, my initial thought was just that, oh, this is five, more than five, I think it was more than five weeks before this first game it might have been like five and a half weeks or something like that and i thought even if he broke a bone he'd probably be back for <laughs> might be back for the start of the season so um yeah and they they pretty much quickly after the game said that they didn't think that it was uh or after the scrimmage um a major a major thing so um yeah i don't i didn't sense any kind of panic i think having him go down in the first scrimmage though People were probably wondering what kind of luck the Billikens were were about to have. I'm sure the Indiana State fans were uh, <laughs> were not were not uh, feeling sympathy. Um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, the two players, the two freshmen that really stood out in the exhibition games, Bakar and Kobe, or not Kobe Johnson. It was uh, Amari McCautry. Uh Do you see them? playing a big role on this team? And if so, at what point in the season would you think they would arrive? Yeah, I think, you know, um, Schertz has repeatedly said, you know, we we can't close the door on anything. It's not like we're going to settle on a rotation in the first two weeks and go with it. And those are two guys that he's really talked up. And he says they're the two most talented players on the team, highest ceiling. Um, they both had a good... Uh, exhibition game and um, I think it's just a matter of becoming more consistent and um, being better defensively um, learning the system and so on and so forth Picard missed what six weeks um, and a big chunk of time in the summer because he went and played uh, for the Netherlands and um, you know they're freshmen and they need time and I think he I think he, it would be his preference that both of them develop enough so that their contributors come you know January because they're both I mean they're both really high ceiling guys yeah for sure um you know when when we're looking at all of the stuff that you've 
you've put out so far, which is, I got to say a lot. I mean, it's, it's been incredible on your, on your sub stack kind of wondering, like, as, as you sort of, you know, hit your stride with this thing, how are you determining like what's behind the paywall and, and what isn't, how does that work? Mm, well, yeah, I just kind of, I'm, I winged it, you know, I just, again, I, I had no experience doing anything like this. I, they Substack gives you options when when you're uh, setting up subscriptions, like you know, let them have stuff for free for this much time or for this much time. And I thought, oh, a week's good. <laughs> I wanted to maybe have a paywall before, honestly, before the season started. Mm. Um, so to try and attract people, you know, show them what I was going to do, and then um, after a week, I, I'm going to do stuff. My plan is to do stuff every week. I don't know how much it may only be one thing or two things at the most that will be free. Um, you know, like maybe a, a, a wrap up of the week of the games and just kind of some general thoughts and comments from sure it's comments from me, something like that for the um, free subscribers. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I offer, you know, they let you do the thing where um, you, you can show them, two or three paragraphs of what the story is and then, you know, try and lure them into <laughs> lure. That sounds so deceitful uh, <laughs> into paying for the content. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's my new job. So I, you know, I do, I want to be compensated for my time. Um, I didn't know what to expect in terms of whether I was going to actually make any money, make, you know, any money at all. I didn't know if there'd be any money coming in, but um, because the response was good, it's kind of been motivation to really crank out material. Um, and with good access, it's, it's not difficult to come up with ideas. And some of the stuff I'm throwing out, you know, a lot of the stuff would not have got in the paper. Most of it would not have gotten in the paper. Um, and some of it, I just kind of throwing out, I have an idea and I, I, I write something and I, I'm not sure if really anyone's going to want to read it, but I throw it out there. But because why not? I mean, it's 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 a it's a little bit more information, and people can decide whether they want to take a look at it. I think yeah. I think if it's interesting to you, it's probably going to be interesting to some to us. Someone, to some, yeah, yeah. To someone. I mean, I think that like you have right now the most prolific. Well certainly the most access since the uh the gray seasons documentary uh which no, i don't think anybody in the world is ever going to get that kind of access to slew athletics again but um i mean it is i mean five articles a week i think regardless of what they are talking about if it's about billiken basketball or even <laughs> billiken athletics i think there's there's somebody out there i mean obviously you've got two chuckleheads in front of you who are who are gonna read every every line? So um, I think I think Billiken fans have just been starved for uh, for attention, the, so to speak. Just because you know, yeah, like, maybe so. I mean, you for years it's been post dispatch won't do this. Like I, I think it's a breath of fresh air to have. Just like it was probably a breath of fresh air, and now it's gotten stale that I have a podcast. That you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. it's a breath of fresh air to to have a new avenue to to read Billiken stuff. Yeah, and I hope to. I don't know if I've done as much other sports yet as I want to do, but uh, I, I'll continue to you know do more uh, women's basketball and soccer as long as it plays out. Um, I guess that's pretty much what's going on right now, and then refigure things out in the spring um uh obviously men's basketball is the highest interest sport um so there's going to be a lot more of that than anything else but i do want you know i know there's there's good interest in soccer when they're doing well Us, we can and, we uh, can show you our numbers <laughs> it's, we have a good, very good idea of of how the the season flows <laughs> Because we will. I mean, in let, terms of spring, spring fall, oh, yes. fall winter, yeah. spring. Oh yes, I yeah, mean yeah, it goes. Sure. It drops probably two hundred uh, listens yeah. in we're, the we're, in the summer. We're we're starting to pick up again right now. Oh so. yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. It's, so it was the perfect. It was the perfect time for me to get out, even though I wasn't planning to get out of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, the timing was good for for to make this transition. Uh, yeah. No. So, uh, 
Go ahead, Pete. Sorry. I, I do want to like circle back to something. Speaking of the paper, you said that uh, 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 most of what you've written so far wouldn't be in the paper. Is it just for the fact of uh, the, the, the fight over space and, and just not having enough space and everything? Or is there a, also a content thing? Like, would there be an editor just kind of killing the idea? Um, there is a space thing. You're competing no matter what time of year it is, you're competing with the Cardinal. I mean, yeah. that, that's always whatever is going on. Um, um, there's, uh, what else do we have here? We've got the blues now. So right now during basketball, you're competing with the blues. Um, you're competing with Mizzou football. Um, and then Mizzou basketball, which I think Mizzou basketball and slew basketball get pretty much the same coverage in the post now. Um, and then whatever else, the battle Hawks, I don't know. <laughs> the ambush, the just, city. There's just lim there's limited space. So what I would do when I was, you know, once the season started the last 10 years, you know, I'd write a story on game day on, you know, a feature on a player or some kind of angle. I'd cover the game, do another feature you know for the next game that week so i'd usually do like four things a week maybe a fifth you know whenever there was something interesting or breaking news like fred thatch tearing his acl or oh, man the Grove, vibes. You know, um you know coming out with his mental health um issues and things like that i would jump on and do things but i was kind of in a formula of doing those basics that basic formula of stories of features and game stories um throughout the whatever four months of the season now so, i can just throw up anything i want any day right and and of the stuff you've put up so far has there been anything that has kind of stood out i don't know how much you're looking at your own data or what substack gives you or anything like that but has anything st stood out so far in terms of the response it's gotten whether it's just clicks comments anything yeah. Uh, the comments are sparse, but there are some. Um, but Substack gives you great data. It's really, yeah, I'm a little too obsessed with it at this point. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, they tell you how many, how many, you know, I'm getting about 700 page views per day. Um, and the stories, um, you know, they give you the number of, of, of views on each story. Um, and they give you, like, even the subscriptions you get from each story. Um and an assortment of other things, you know, where your subscribers are, what states they're in. What, I had someone from the Philippines sign up. Um, mm -hmm. But, there, I mean, yeah, there have been certain stories that, I mean, not that I thought were particularly great, but that were of interest to people, like um, the one I wrote about, the shot chart um, yeah. breakdown and the lack of mid-range shots got a lot of views. This thing I did last week on the player breakdown and yeah. kind of pecking order of the players um, got a, a ton of views. I, I think I read that one maybe four or five times <laughs> as, just, just <laughs> as I was trying to familiarize myself with it. Yeah, and, and I keep reading it too also because I'm like, yeah, should this guy be higher or where, you know, how, because I was, I was tr kind of trying to, without putting numbers on him, I was trying to kind of give up uh, an order of, of players in terms of maybe how they might be used, when they might be used. Um, and there were a couple others that got more views than others, but that's, that's been a pretty good consistency overall. Uh, is, uh, is Tom Timmerman up there in uh, Sioux Falls right now with you or have you guys been, uh, he's not with me. Um, I think he's here yeah. somewhere. What well, you know, you're not, you're not concerned about that. Uh, the post anymore, <laughs> but uh, I'll run into him tomorrow at the, at the Pentagon. I'm going to go early and catch, catch all these, uh, former slew guys yeah um and see see how they fit in to their to their new teams that's going to be interesting to watch too yeah a lot of familiar names uh in, in the event for us are, are you yeah. also going to try and make it down to the women's game um afterwards? i thought about it but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be able to get down there it's just not gonna work out so um yeah that's unfortunate if they were too bad they're not like playing in the same town but yeah it's about an hour apart uh, yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it's not a long drive, but it just it just won't work for what I'm doing. All right, so one last question, I think, and we'll let you go. Um, what what do you what do you expect out of the Billikens this year? You you've been down and dirty with the team. Uh, what what do you think is going to happen this year? Give us your 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 best take. 
Um, I could use the Josh Schertz line and say that they have a, a wide bandwidth, as he's been saying. Um, I love that. Picked. That guy is yeah, it's one, of his, one of his, um, you know, being picked everywhere from uh, top 25 in the country to wherever, middle of the pack in the A-10 or whatever. Um, he, When I hear him say that he thinks they have championship potential, um, that makes me think that, Maybe they won't win the championship, but they should definitely be top four. I mean, we should consider them a top four um, Atlantic 10 team. Um, is that good enough to get in the NCAA tournament? I don't know. But, you know, the other thing he said is there's a lot more ways to be bad than there are to be good. And anything can happen. And it seems like he's open to the potential that they might not be as nearly as good as people think. But... um I would think top four and competing for an NCAA tournament berth. I don't, I don't see them. You know, think that they're going to be a, a six seed and uh, go into the Sweet Sixteen necessarily. But you know, is that possible in the next couple of years? Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, <laughs> I like yeah. That. yeah. I think I most mean, people. I mean, would. I mean, I, I would, would prefer. Would. I would prefer to get out of the number four. I'd try, I try, you know, three would be nice. That way we can kind of exercise the the four seed demons a little bit. That seemed to, <laughs> but no, yeah, I uh, I think everybody's really excited about the season. I think um, you being able to just crank out whatever whatever suits your mood is is great for fans, uh, you know, who have been, again, I, I think Billiken fans are always starving for, for content because they don't get, they don't get it like, uh, the bigger schools do. So w we appreciate you, uh, you know, a coming on the podcast and be just, you know, uh, putting out the kind of content you are right now. Cause it is, it is prolific. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me and, uh, and the kind words it's been, it's actually been quite fun. Um, and uh, just kind of freeing to you get to, the mojo uh, to back able to do it this way, huh? You got the mojo back. I just, it's just yeah, it's just there's a little more fun in in writing, and you know I go to practice almost every day, which you know I wasn't doing before because I would have other assignments that I had to do, and you know now I I can just be go over there and be one of the nerds and and hang out and just watch practice for two hours, and um, it's actually quite enjoyable. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear, and I think that uh, that definitely shows up in what you've you've been putting out there so far. Yeah, so, you can definitely uh, tell. Yeah, people need to to get over there, check it out, and uh, and be sure and subscribe. And that is uh, Stu on Slu at it's it's Stu on Slu all one word dot substack dot com. If I've got that right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, and then if is you're it? not if you're not following Stu as well on Twitter, what are you doing? Uh, it is, what is, what's the at on Twitter? Stu Durando. All right. That's yeah, stud. That's stud Durando, everybody. That's, yeah, are you that's, the one that posted that? On, no, no on that, that was, that, that was, was Pete. That was me. That I, 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 I like that as the alter ego. I, I think. And it actually that. almost got, it was on a, on a proof of a page as a byline for me going back a long time and somebody some, somebody supposedly looked at it who had hadn't been at the paper long and said, and made a comment to someone else. I can't believe there's someone on the staff named Stud, and the, and the other person <laughs> went, "Oh my God, we've got to we've got to fix that." <laughs> uh, we, we we could have been otherwise talking it would to, have been in. Yeah, that would have been it. We could have been talking to Stud Urando right now. I, if you I, just I, I, if you I put wish... on some glasses, you, then you're <laughs> then you're Stud. Uh, <laughs> not the glasses I have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Stu, thank you again so much, and uh, enjoy the uh, fresh air of South Dakota. Yes, it's crisp. <laughs> Have All a right. good night. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks again to Stu Durando uh, for joining the show and, um, yeah, giving us any insight uh, he can provide because he really is, like you said, he's at practice every day. It's, it's I think, Pete, that was – an eye-opening conversation for multiple reasons. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, it, in addition to just kind of what what he's doing and what he's seeing and 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 what he can say about uh, you know players and coaches and everything, 
Um, I, I kind of see it, Zach, as like this new piece of a full diet of slew mm-hmm. content, right? For I know you hate the word content, but like between us and 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 Stu and you know whatever comes out of the official uh you know athletic department stuff and then like you're kind of the online conversation with west yeah. pine bills and jack and everybody i think now there's like a really well-rounded yeah. uh, uh, uh approach of like where you can get information on on slew and it's great and i also think that like you know he talked about what's going on at the post dispatch and how it's just shrinking in in literal and figurative ways and I, I think, and I had this conversation with um, some other people last week, just, it, it just, this is kind of where media content is going is people are willing to pay for the things that they care about, but they don't want all the extra stuff they don't care about. You know what I mean? And I, I, I think that's kind of what's happening here. And this is just one more um, step in that direction. So that's a long winded way of saying, I think. Uh, if you're listening to us, you'd really get a lot out of um, subscribing to that su- Substack, and it's a pretty reasonable price and uh, and well worth it so far. It's been great. Let's talk some more men's basketball. We've already talked about 30 minutes with Stu, but let's uh, get into some other things. Uh, the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame uh, inducted its Hall of Fame class of 2024 and Two Billiken personalities are on that list. Yeah, this was really cool. Uh, number one, Anthony Bonner, and number two, Earl Austin Jr. And Zach, er, you know, Earl being more of like a like a media figure um, is one thing. Bonner, you know, being like a, a all American college player and then an NBA player, you're kind of like, I can't believe he already wasn't in the uh, the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame, but. Um, nonetheless, super cool. They're both in the class of 2024 and anytime you can get multiple Billikens recognized, um, that's, 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 you know, that's great to me. Warms my heart to see it. Uh, speaking of recognition, uh, we have a current Billiken who has been named to the Naismith trophy watch list. One of 50 named nationwide only representative from the A-10 and that is the one and only Pete. Robbie Avila and, and, and Zach, I was kind of keeping an eye on this because a lot of times we see like, oh, so and so was a ten offensive player of the week or defensive player of the week or whatever, and we normally don't even highlight those just because they kind of come and go. And this is one where, yes, it's a preseason watch list and not an award, but given that there are fifty nationwide and they really do heavily favor, you know, the big names and power conferences and everything. I was keeping my eye on this just to kind of wondering whether we could see our guy Robbie show up on it just because he he's he's different, right? He's built yeah. different and he's got a different literally and figuratively. He's got a a different level of interest. He's a, he's a special player. Uh we know, but uh you wonder how much everybody else knows that. So, a uh, very cool recognition and uh hopefully he can live up to this top 50 hype. Pete, it's been a long, long, long off season full of will they, won't they's with the Billikens and Josh shirts, full of uh, following one of the weirdest coaching carousels of all time, hoping and praying that Josh shirts was going to be the head coach. Uh, now we sit here less than than 12 hours no more than 12 uh, less than 24 hours <laughs> away from watching the billikens take the floor under the direction of josh shirts how are you feeling i'm i'm feeling number one extremely excited uh number two i'm nervous mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I really, really want to win this first game and have you been watching the, the, the betting lines or anything like that at all? Uh, it's been going from like minus one to plus one. Right. So, right? so this is essentially, uh, within the margin of error, as they say, like this is, it's kind of a toss up, um, it, 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 according to the, the betting odds anyway. And Zach, that's the regular season opener that we have. If you're listening to our voices, uh, the day that this releases, it's today. It's Monday, November fourth, two p.m. Central. It's here. The Field of sixty-eight 
opening day showcase at the Sanford Pentagon in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's streaming live on the Field of 68's YouTube channel for free. And it's against Santa Clara, Zach. And and um, Pete, Pete, I think I think we should take a moment here. Yes. Uh, to provide uh, our listeners with instructions on how to watch this game. Okay. Yeah, I All think right. that might be necessary. So let me let me hold on. Let's All right, Billiken fans. Here is how you can watch today's game against uh, Santa Clara on the Field of 68's YouTube channel. Uh, we are going to go to YouTube, and then you're going to go to the search bar right here and type in Field of 68. Hit enter. You will see. Hey, look, you can even go right from here. If you click this link right here, it will take you right to the game, and this is where it will show up. You don't need to log in. You don't need to do anything other than go to YouTube, uh, go to the Field of 68 YouTube channel and click uh, the link that says St. Louis versus Santa Clara. Now, if you just get the Field of 68 channel, you can click this round button right here. And then that will take you to uh, the Field of 68's YouTube channel. And I thought it was easier the last time I went here. Uh, you can just go to live and then... You've obviously got all the live games. You've got uh, every game of this tournament or showcase. Uh, and, of course, the Billikens start at 2 p.m. And six people are waiting right now. So that's how you watch it. It's very... It, I, I think this is probably the easiest a Billiken game has ever been to watch since they moved off of uh, basic channels. The, you know... Two, four, five, eleven, thirty. Right. So, yeah, this is this is. I mean, this this is where the uh, college basketball fans are going to have their attention. So, uh, it's exciting to be on the field of sixty-eight. I think, Pete. Yeah, I think so too. And and if you're you know if you're following them on their social media, they're going to make it abundantly clear there how to get there. But it's free. It's easy. It's on YouTube. Just, just go do it. It's easy. your your streaming uh, device should have a YouTube app that's an easy download. Again, you don't even have to log in. So once you download that app, just follow those steps on your app, um, and and you should be good to go. If not, hit us up, tweet at us, and I can walk you through it. Yeah, <laughs> by a tweet, we'll make sure that that uh, everybody gets to see this. Um, we do have some on the court stuff to talk about uh some news we talked with Stu Durando about it but uh just to reiterate Pete Kobe Johnson uh questionable for tomorrow's game not the news Billiken fans wanted to hear no but you know he's a game time decision they said he he injured his shoulder in practice on Saturday he was slated to start according to one of Stu's pieces um in the last few days I look at this Zach game time decision, right? Like 50, 50. This is, this is just, I, I identify with this so much. Cause when people ask me if I want to do something, I'm always yes. a game time decision. <laughs> so I understand this. Yeah. So, so is there some gamesmanship to this? I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't think they're just making it up. Um, but it's, it's but, not Bruce Zhang. Right. That's, that's right. But I think, um, I think this, you, you always hate to hear about an injury, but the fact that he's a game time decision tomorrow, you know, the next day uh, or within 48 hours of it occurring anyway, uh, it to me is not the worst news because if he doesn't play this game, he'll play the next one. Right. Um, we are a little thin at this position. Josiah Dotzler has been out the past few weeks with a, with an ankle. So um, I, you know, we're, we're going to be a little thin at, at, traditional guard positions uh that that said it could the the news could always be a lot worse when somebody injures their shoulder you mentioned josiah dotzler and man i i think this is the one player that billiken fans have no idea what to expect from well we did we did see him a little bit in that scrimmage uh you know a month and a half ago whenever that was so um i think some people liked what they saw there and uh and know that we've got something here so Hopefully he's back to 100% after his injury. And 
I don't know, Zach. I, I'm kind of high on him. I, I think I'm a little more optimistic. Um, oh, I'm certainly optimistic about him. It's just, yeah, it's just really funny that a guy that we think is going to play heavily into the rotation. Yeah. Uh, we haven't seen him yet, but it, I mean, yeah, no, th- th- that's true. I just think like in the, in the long term, I think he's a really nice player. He's got that look to him. And, oh God. Yeah. Uh, I trust, I trust anything. Anytime Creighton fans are upset about losing a player. I trust, I trust in them. There's, I, I would mm-hmm. say there's not many. I-, I love Creighton fans. I think Creighton fans are, are some of the best in the nation. So I'm going to, I'm going to ride with them. Yeah, and 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 look, I mean, like the the only issue right now is that he just hasn't played much the past few weeks. It's um, and I think a couple months from now we'll we'll really be happy with him. Uh, Pete Santa Clara was picked to finish third in the West Coast Conference. They were in the preseason poll, just behind St. Mary's and just ahead of San Francisco. I think everybody knows that Gonzaga is number one in that league as long as they're in it. Uh, which is not much longer, but they're they're a good team, Zach. They won 20 games last season, including an upset over Gonzaga at one point. Herb Sendek is the head coach. He's now in his ninth season there. He hasn't been able to finish higher than third in the conference, which I know is frustrating, but it's kind of the nature of that league. Nor has he made an NCAA tournament yet there, um, but they are trending the right direction. They've won 20 or more games each of the past three seasons, gone to the NIT twice, in those three seasons. Um, they've got two guys on the preseason all conference team. The way the West Coast Conference does it, they just have one team with eleven players, and that's Adama, Alpha Ball, and Carlos Stewart. So those are really, you know, the main guys we're going to be watching here. Um, Ball tested the NBA draft waters, but he returned. He played two seasons at Arizona, didn't really do much. Transferred to Santa Clara last season and averaged about 14 and a half points per game. He's a six, seven matchup problem at guard. Um, and, and size is really something that they, they bring. Um, they returned four of their other top five scorers from last season. Johnny O'Neill, six ten senior forward averaged 11 points and five and a half rebounds last year. Christoph Tilly, seven foot junior center. He averaged 9.4 points, four and a half rebounds a game last year so we're already six seven guard six ten forward seven foot center they're huge uh tyree bryan was the sixth man last season as a junior six five wing who averaged about eight and four a game and then they've got brenton napper a rare small player a six foot junior guard who scored over six points a game but he's a 40 percent shooter from outside um, and then the newcomers, we've got Stewart, who I mentioned before, Carlos Stewart. He's both a newcomer and a returner. He spent two years at Santa Clara, transferred to LSU for a season, and now he's back with the Broncos. I guess the grass is not always greener. He averaged 15.2 points a game as a sophomore at Santa Clara and 4.7 points per game last season at LSU. His minutes, percentages, and totals were down across the board. He's also kind of on the smaller side at six one. Uh, But again, a really good player. And then the last guy I want to highlight, Elijah Mahi. He's uh, 6'7", 220, big forward Juco transfer. He led uh, West Valley College to an undefeated 33-0 season last year. Averaged 17.5 points a game, over 6.5 rebounds. So if he can be productive at this level, Santa Clara actually has a good chance to be better than they were last year and a solid number three in this conference. So those two are the newcomers in addition to those uh, returners they really only lost one key player from last season this is a good team zach experienced big and as far as i know healthy too um i i gotta say it's sounding like rebounding is gonna be uh uh key in this one it is they don't have one of those guys who's like a 10 boards a game kind of guy but everybody's got size at their position and everybody's pretty productive on the glass with with the exception of the two smaller guards um, uh, you know, everybody else is, is going to be, um, a, a test on the glass to I'll put it that way. And I mean, especially interior defense as well, you For know, sure. you've got, uh, you know, they're big men and, and I mean, we've got Kalu Anya, AJ Casey, mm-hmm. um, you know, we might, I, I could see uh, Max Picard getting some early minutes, uh, with, you know, you've got a seven foot junior center. You, I mean, Picard's got the footwork. I know he's more of a guard, but yeah. we, I know, you know, and, and we have yet to fully adopt all of Schertz's positional terminology, but if you're using more traditional 
uh, positions. We outside of our our backcourt, and we are actually a little bit with Swope, but we're giving up size at every position here and every matchup here. So yeah, you're right. It's going to be something to look for. Uh, let's talk about where the computers and the uh, know-it-alls uh, rate Santa Clara. Yeah, I put five ratings in here just to kind of give a, a cross section of where they were, and it's pretty consistent. Zach Torvik has them at ninety-eight coming into the season. Ken Palm is at ninety-four. Uh, Evan Miyakawa has Santa Clara at eighty-seven, a little bit better. CBS was their highest rating that I found at eighty-five, and then SI, who you know I don't think they even have that much credibility anymore, but they're at number ninety, pretty consistent with the rest of them. So. That's that's kind of where the the computers have them is is kind of in that eighty five to one hundred range, um, which seems about right. But they I think their upside potential is is stronger than that. Yeah, looking at an average score of ninety there, right? So I I put that into Google. God, you know what? The Google AI is the one AI I can get down with because it's um, just I can uh, I can it's fine. Yeah. Um. Uh, okay, what comes next after Santa Clara here, Pete? Because uh, I don't know if many people know who Avila University is, other than uh, their name uh, suspiciously matches our star players. That's right, yeah, and and they, they leveraged that to get this game set up. But there's going to be a little confusion there. I do think you're right that they pronounce it a little bit differently. But Avila University is the regular season home opener on Sunday the 10th. We've talked about this before, the lower division games. I know there's not a lot of uh, headliners on the schedule this year, and we've got two of the lower division games, but not much we can do about it at this point, and it sucks that it's the home opener. But but look, if you can't make it down to Shea Fitz, this one will be on ESPN+, Plus. so an, another way to stream. Um, Avila is a small Catholic school in Kansas City, Zach. They compete in the Kansas Collegiate Athletic Conference, which is in NAIA. Um, they were 4-19 and last season. They ended the season on a five-game losing streak. It was the first season for head coach um, Tyler Breedenhoff, I think is his last name. He's back this year for year two. They should be a little bit better. Most of the roster's JUCO transfer um, players with just a few players who came there straight from high school. There's always a chance that they've got a stronger crop of talent in a given year when they're turning the roster over like that. And they're mostly juniors and seniors, so they've got a, a lot of experience. But like... When you look at this and what they were last season, where where they compete, what level, this, this has got to be like a fifty point win. It just it just has to be. So um, it's a it's a please nobody get hurt kind of game, and uh, it, it's just another time to get out there against game competition and uh, and sharpen yourselves for the rest of the season. I think this game. I mean, besides. Look, we all know that it's annoying that we're playing a uh, lower division team. Yeah. But I think this game shows a likability and a and a and an ability to kind of you know not take things so seriously. And, and I think that's kind of really encouraging for this staff. I mean, I know prior staff had, you know, the the falling down the hill uh ocean spray meme the the dunk tank but like i don't know this team it, it just really feels like it's it's serious but it's not the end of the world and i think that's kind of kind of endearing they kind of knew this was going to be a lower division game that they had to settle for and um if if this school my understanding is they they reached out and tried to make it happen and and it's like sure why not that's yeah. fun let's do it uh Let's close the loop on a few guys. Um, did we close the loop last week, or I don't remember? We, we did on a few, but but okay. these are new. These are new ones, Zach. We don't really have much this week to talk about new offers or visits. So I just want to follow up with some of the bigger names that we've been recruiting because these these are bigger names. Six ten forward Nicholas Randall, who some people might know from when he played at Vashon. He has committed to Mizzou. He was down to a top three of Mizzou, Creighton, and San Francisco. Uh, but I, I knew his slew recruitment was done when he left Vashon for Compass Prep in Arizona before this school year. Uh, another guy slew offered is Caden Mingo. Uh, he he committed to Friday to uh, on Friday to Penn State. Uh, we were not in his top four. 
This one's a big one, though, Zach. Isaiah Seeley. He named his top four on Tuesday, and they are Arkansas, Cal, Ole Miss, and Boston College. We had talked about him a lot previously because he was really, in addition to being a big-time recruit, a big-time priority for SLU. But things kind of broke down earlier in um, October, is our understanding, uh, between the two sides. And then lastly, Adriel Nyorha, who um, may be for the better because I'm sure I'm butchering his name every time. He's a 6'5", 2025 guard from Ottawa, Ontario, uh, but he attends school down in North Carolina and committed to Arkansas State on Friday, uh, which I think he will excel at. I think he's probably a higher level player than that when all is said and done. But he had a slew offer and visited campus. So, um, yeah, those are the four guys, you know, that I just wanted to circle back on and give people updates. Uh, moving over to the women's side on the hardwood, uh, 65-44 win versus Missouri s and on Tuesday the 29th. Uh, good Lord, this game was something. Yeah, I don't think it was the easiest uh, game to watch is my understanding. I, I, I don't know if at 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, I don't know if this is one I would have I've been keen on because this was uh, this was ugly on the turnover side of things. I mean, great job defensively yeah, for the Billikens, yeah. but yeah, they forced thirty-one turnovers from the Miners. They held them to six points in both the first and the third quarters. Held them to fifteen point four percent three-point shooting. They stymied their ball movement, giving them just three That's assists. A good word. They never let them back into the game, which is which is key for this slew team. Um, they did give up 10 offensive rebounds, not a disaster, but I think you want to hold a lower division team to single digits there. And you uh, definitely but, don't want to turn it over 21 times. Yeah, that's just way too high against anybody, Zach. I don't I don't care who you're playing, but especially when you're playing a lower division team. And yeah. all, all due respect to Missouri S&T, uh, a very fine school, but um, the, you know you, you can't turn it over 21 times. Not in an A-10 game, not against Tennessee, not against anybody. You just can't. So 52 combined turnovers, I think, made this really a hard-to-watch game. Uh, I, I mean, not to mention, I mean, the shooting, you know, just adds fuel to the fire. 429 from the field, 217 from three, and 60% from the line, um, which just means the defense has to be excellent to constant. Con compensate for it uh go. thank you yeah thanks for your patience there uh yeah zach i mean like am i concerned about the shooting you know it, it's early it's preseason like i don't like the free throw shooting that's the one that in both games has kind of bothered me because they've they've typically been a pretty good free throw shooting team um maybe that's the kyla mcmakin factor though she was she was pretty she got to the line a lot and was a pretty effective shooter there so uh that that's definitely something to watch over the course of this year um, any clarity as far as the question marks from the first exhibition at all? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on some of those because because we just kind of, you know, we didn't really know who this team was quite yet. To circle on Brooklyn Gray, she's back. She played 15 minutes, so that's good news. The starting lineup, Gray replaced Nazario with Kennedy Calhoun, Peyton Kennedy, Tierra Simon, and freshman Shantiria Anumale rounding out the top five. That seems to me like the most likely starting five to begin the regular season. I I, I think that's kind of the, where they're going to roll. Uh, perimeter scoring was a question. We know the three-point shooting was dreadful. No way around that. But the good sign is that Anumale led SLU in field goal attempts with 19. She was more efficient in this game than she was in the first game when she shot 33%. And then she led SLU with 3.6 shooting from outside, finished with 20 points. We might really have something in her, Zach. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm like cautiously optimistic that we've got like maybe the best um, freshman guard since, um, you know, the the. I mean, Teresa Lish. I I was gonna say. Um, I think um, Teresa Lish was the best to show up. Better, better than. Uh, 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 why am I blanking on her name? Left Kaisha? Yeah, Harbison, who left for Vanderbilt. I think so. I mean, that was obvious... gonna be my comp. I guess. Hmm. I, I, I just, maybe I'm, you know, reaching into the nostalgia bucket, mm -hmm. but like she felt like she just commanded a I, presence I, on the court. 
Yes. I, Comparative I think, to Kaija. Yeah, I would agree with that. When all was said and done, you know, Kaija did leave and she became like, I think she was second or third team. Technically, they team. both left early. Yeah, yeah. Although Teresa just called it a career. <laughs> wow, which is. Yeah. Okay. Good for her. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, this is a, this is a really, I mean, to, to be starting and scoring 20, yeah. um, in an exhibition game when you just showed up, I mean, that's, that, that seems meaningful to me. So I, I think we might really have something in her and, and on a day when both Kennedy and Mia Bergstrom weren't hitting, she was, and then you've also got Brooklyn gray in the lineup, which takes some pressure off of Kennedy as well. So I think the perimeter things could be okay there after all. Um, we asked about the six, five players last week. They both played, but only combined for five minutes. So seems like they're just kind of bringing them along a little bit more slowly. They are. Yeah. And Haidara, I'm not sure she's ever going to be a rotation player. She's like a grad student now. Um, but Trianta Feely, um, you do want to see her kind of develop into a rotation player at some point, um, being a transfer from Syracuse. So, Hopefully we get some more production out of them um, because we definitely need the size and rebounding. Maya Glanton, Zach, 12 minutes, no points, four rebounds, two fouls, two turnovers, and a steal. Still not sure why she's not showing much, but I guess she's just kind of getting up to speed in this yeah. system. A little bit different. Um, yeah, Nook Shavers. Seems like she's still above Glanton and the six five players in the lineup, but she did get in foul trouble in this one and ended up with just two points. Um, and five rebounds in 10 minutes. Kennedy Calhoun did get her foul count down three in uh, 27 minutes, better than the previous game. Three assists, four steals, but four turnovers. She just needs to play with more control. I, I wonder how much of her, uh, you know, fouling is is the the progression of her in uh, in importance on the defensive end. So, like, obviously, without Martinez now, right. you have to find that next person that's going to guard the the best player on the floor for the other team. And I would imagine it's falling on Kennedy Calhoun, and and I think it's going to take some some adjustment to that. There's going to be some growing pains in that role, and I, I I think she's probably putting a lot of pressure on herself too, right? I mean, imagine line up next to julia martinez yeah. on defense every day and seeing what she does and then thinking like oh god i gotta i've gotta make up for that yeah. that's a that's a lot so um so hopefully she can just kind of fall into a, a routine there so closing out games not an issue in this one but i think that kind of wraps up the talking points from last week but just overall zach this was just really sloppy and i do worry that they've got a lot of work on and not a lot of time left before the regular season starts and it starts yeah. off with, you know, some two very good teams. Yeah, I mean, it's it's today. It's Monday, November 4th at South Dakota. Uh, by the way, for the first time in school history, both the men's and women's programs will be starting the season in the state of South Dakota on the same day. It is possible. That's an incredible, that's an incredible baseball stat. It's like the left-handed pitcher when it's raining in August. Mm-hmm. But I mean, is this the first time the men's and women's programs will be starting the same season in the same state on the same day? That I don't know, and I would, I, I would guess, I would find it hard to believe that they've never both started. I'm like all. a doubleheader. Yeah, that, I'm sure. I'm sure they have before, but the fact that they are both in the state of South Dakota of all places, is, right? Yeah. It's not like they're playing in places that they're used to. That's going. the that's the budget cuts they're talking about. <laughs> so they only have one charter plane. So uh, so the women are going to be down in Vermilion, about an hour south of uh, Sioux Falls. Uh, their game's at 5.30, so it's possible to catch the the men's game, which is at 2. It'll end at 4. You've got about 90 minutes to get to your car, get down to Vermilion. It's doable. Uh, but if you're listening to this right now when the episode drops and you're not already getting close or already in Sioux Falls, you're probably too late. Uh, But yeah, Zach, South Dakota is a good team. The Coyotes were good last season going 23 and 13, picked to finish fourth in the summit this season. So it's a tough opening test and things get even harder on Thursday, November 7th, when they go to Drake uh, to start with the second straight road game um, this season. Drake's really, really good. Yeah, They were picked to win the Valley this year. 29 and 6 last year, 19 and 1 in conference play. 
They won the Valley Tournament on top of it. They did lose to five-seed Colorado in the first round of the NCAA Tournament, but this is a very, very, very good basketball team. And, uh, I, you know, if if they can pick off one of these games, more likely South Dakota, but um, they're they're both tall orders. So if they can pick off one of these, I'd be very happy with that. Yeah, this is certainly going to be a, a test. I, I think you're going to learn a lot really quickly and to be honest, this could be an ugly week. Um, it has the potential to be. I don't know if it will. Uh, maybe, you know, Stone, or not Stone, Jesus. Till it's got some uh, magic up her sleeve. She always seems to have some magic up her sleeve. So uh, maybe she will have them ready to go. Yeah, let's see if she can find that magic in November this season. Dear God, please. Um, you know what's ma- what was You know what's magical? The first time I ever had two men in a garden salsa, it was like the world just made sense. Yeah, Zach, it, it, it sure did. Uh, uh, it sure does. I mean, like I, I every I've been, time I've been on like such a uh, like a pickle kick lately. You know, as I've as a I've, kickle. Yeah, very yeah. well. Yeah, well done. Um, but I'm now craving their salsa again. It's it's been uh, it's been too long since I put in an order, and I think I'm gonna get one going here after we wrap up the show. So later this week, I can have that awesome moment when that box um, hits my porch. And I'm kind of finding myself craving the the fruit salsas for some reason. It's been a long time since I've had the mango, the strawberry, the peach, and I got to get back on that kick. Um, you should too. Head over to twomeninagarden.com. Uh, make a box for yourself, nine ninety nine nationwide shipping. If not, pick it up locally in a lot of different grocery stores in the St. Louis area if you are local. But if not, two men in a garden dot com is the way to go. Do you remember the hot pickles that come in the bag? Hot pickles that come in the bag. Yeah, they come in like a little plastic bag. Oh, like individually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking my, about. My my uh, roommate in college, we took a video of him trying. Uh, one of those picks. I think Kickles should be the new collab between us and and Two Minute Garden for like the hot pickles in the bag. All right, I think that's what we need to do. <laughs> we'll add it to the list of ideas yes. we have for them. We're just gonna send them over a list, and then they're gonna yeah. promptly cancel our sponsorship. <laughs> Pete, let's move over to women's soccer, where it, it's it's baffling to me because this team is elite at everything. Uh, minus putting the ball into the back of the net. Uh, they can put it uh, inches wide off the both posts and the crossbar. Uh, they just cannot seem to find uh, that scoring touch in the final third. And I, I think it's going to keep them from, from reaching the heights that they really want to be. Yeah, Zach, and this this inefficiency issue, this lack of finishing, has been kind of a threat all season long. And I, we've talked about losing Caroline Kelly. We've talked about uh, some of the other, you know, like uh, you know, losing the tactical. Yeah, out. we were like, okay, what's the personnel? Right, like so. So there are some there are some factors, and there's you know more than one variable. You can't call it any one thing. But at some point you have to go like, is this mental? Like, what is this? Because, um, I mean, they had so many opportunities in this game against Davidson on Saturday, and uh, and it was still kind of close. Yeah, I mean, is it, it obviously you know as a as a coaching staff and a team they've got to come up with a way to solve these defenses, and obviously you're going to have these teams that are going to be throwing their best shot at the Queens. Um, mm-hmm. but again, you know, I, I think when you have teams sit in and defend like heroes, because that's all they can do, you're going to run into these games where you have a million shots on goal and they're just either blocking everything or you're hitting the post or it's sailing high, but th- yeah. they've got to find a way to, to break through. And I think that's really where. Chris Allen came in and that was, you know, set pieces. Um, They are going to have to find the magic. 
Yeah, they really are. Um, so, so they had a two nothing win over Davidson, and I, I know it sounds crazy for us to be like, "What's wrong?" But Slew's the one seed, Davidson's the eight seed, and and coming into this tournament, you see a lot of teams that Slew played close this season. Mm-hmm. Davidson's a team they hadn't played yet, but on paper that they were a lot better than. So, Slew winds up out shooting Davidson twenty seven five, but still only managed two goals, you know, overall against the Wildcats, and the second one came off a of PK from Lindsay Heckel in the 59th minute. So only one goal from the run of play yeah. when you've got 27, uh, 27 shots. And uh, I, mean, I mean, really no, no goals in the run of play. I mean, a corner I mean, I kick, guess, I, uh, I guess that's true. I guess that's but true. But again, yeah, uh, you've got the I, corner kick goal, which is absolutely huge because that's where yeah. they've struggled the entire season. So you like to see that, but again, no goals from, you know, without a whistle involved. Yeah, and 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 when so that one was the first one was Lucy Schwartz. She yep. got it off an Izzy Lubert corner, and it was in the ninth minute. So at this point, you're like, okay, it's all slew so far. We might this could be a route. The route might be on right. So you see, so you're optimistic that way. You make it all the way to halftime. You're still only up one nil, and it's like. Okay, what's going on here? Let's let's uh <laughs> let's finish here. And and, and, the, and uh, the Davidson opportunities were legit opportunities. Yeah, they didn't have many, right? They they had um I think just so yeah, five shots overall, two on goal. Um but those were those were good good chances. So, yeah, little pockering moments as you like to call them, Zach. Yes. Um and D- Davidson held the line defensively, you know, I guess the bend don't break thing. So the quality of chances is still what's um what Slew's struggling with. They only get sh- seven shots on goal out of those 27 attempts. Although um as we said they did h- hit the woodwork a few times and uh and those don't exactly count as shots on goal unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think, I think with this team, it's obvious that getting to the NCAA tournament is, uh, the only acceptable outcome for the season. Um, and you look at the teams that you're going to have to potentially beat again. And, and Dayton's one of those teams. Uh, and the last time out you went zero zero with them and they looked every bit as good as you were. Um, and probably could have come away with a win very easily. Uh, it could have flipped that way. So, Oh, very easily. Yeah, this team's going to, again, I don't know what they're going to find. Uh, I, they don't have a lot of time to find it, but they're going to have to figure out how to yeah. put the ball in the net. Otherwise, they're. I don't see them getting out of the, I don't see them beating these teams again. And that's something you haven't been able to say about this team in four years. Yeah, that's right. So so the positive spin here, Zach, is that SLU hasn't lost since September 1st, and re- they remain the team to beat in the tournament, but they host five-seed St. Joe's on Wednesday the 6th, right? They they tied the Hawks 1-1 at home on October 3rd, and if you remember this game a month ago, they outshot St. Joe's 27-2, to and it, it was 10-2 to in shots on goal, and out of those two, St. Joe's got one through. Um, 16 corners to zero. Um, I would love to think that the frustrations from that game care, you know, are not forgotten by, by Slew's players, but like you look at that, that matchup again and you go, well, if, if they're able to get that many shots off of St. Joe's, that's a team they have the potential to blow out. But at the same time, there's that thing, uh, the, you know, it's the, the, the finishing, but that it's showing up against every team, right? Whatever that is, their, their inability to finish. And that's what kind of scares me here because if they advance, they'll host the winner of two seed Dayton, who you just talked about, and three seed UMass, tied yes. Dayton 0 0, and won 1 0 at UMass on the 19th of September. I'd much rather have UMass than Dayton. I think UMass had a big home field advantage on that long grass um, up there that afternoon. But um, yeah, I, I just don't think this is going to be an easy road, no matter what's left for them. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see how they respond on Wednesday. I, I certainly think they will beat St. Joe's. Um, and then that would go, was that the, the, is that the semifinal? 
That's the semifinal. So okay. it, it, you know, Dayton or Saint, or sorry, Dayton or UMass would be the final. Yeah, and it's on a Sunday. I'm gonna actually probably miss that. I'll probably have to watch on the uh-huh. way back. I'll be out of town um, yeah. until that morning. Um, Pete, on the men's side of things, I, I mean. Uh, yeah, it was a week. Uh, a 7 0 win versus Blackburn on Tuesday, the 29th. Uh, this had to be, uh, again, cathartic. Uh, you take some frustrations out. Uh, the Billikens didn't get on the board, though, until the 26th minute. Grady Easton sets up Drake Fournier. The 11th shot of the game for the Billikens. Uh, Luis Alara scored a second for SLU in the 40th minute with Jackson Delkis and Lawson Redmond getting the assists. Halftime score was 2-0, but the Bills had outshot the Beavers 21-0. to uh, Only five of those were on goal. Jackson Delkis opened up in the 55th minute. Two minutes later, and Tanner Anderson scored off an Olsen assist. 68th minute, Nate Ward uh, from Hecken Label. Ward again three minutes later. With Redmond assisting, Delkis got the game's final goal in the 80th minute. Uh, 42 to 0 in shots. 18 to 0 on goal. I don't goal. think I've ever seen that before. 18 to 0 shots on goal. 13 to 0 in corners, and the fouls were 3 to 2. Blackburn. Um, the game wasn't streaming. Not sure what else to take from it other than. Apparently, this team was just feeling themselves a little too much. Yeah, although I was like, like following along in the first half a little bit, it was kind of like, why aren't, why aren't you guys scoring here? Because I, I remember in previous seasons when we've played Blackburn, it's been, you know, it's been eight or nine goals, but it tended to be, you know, they were scoring a bunch in the first half, and then yeah. you play a bunch of reserves in the second half, and and it slows down a little bit. Um, and it was it was kind of the opposite in this game. It just yeah. it took them a long time to 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 really put it away. So uh, you know, little inverted, but I, I think they needed it. But unfortunately, Zach, it didn't carry into the weekend. No, it didn't. A four one loss at Dayton. Uh, this was the first Billiken loss in September eighth. Again, you look at like this this Billiken soccer team, and the results aren't there, but they. St- yeah, they really haven't. Never mind. I, I'm just, I'm not. Yeah, this is, I, it's not that surprising to see them lose this game. Obviously, Dayton's sitting at 15 in the rankings, but the way they lost this game, it's not what you want to see from a team on the rise. It just, right. it's deflating. It really, you know, it, it puts them in a in a position where they are now going on the road as a six right. seed. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge drop too because they entered the weekend as the two seed. Yeah, like they had the inside track on the two seed. Had they won, they locked up the two seed, um, and even a tie would have had them better off than they are. But but look, Dayton's good. They've worked their way up to number 15. Yeah. They've hung some pretty big numbers on teams, right? Like they five against Detroit, three on UNLV. What did they do? Four SIUE. against West Virginia or whatever it was? They shut out Indiana. They put seven on GW, five on number one West Virginia. Yeah. You're right. That was a huge one. And that and that was like that blew it open for them because since then they've been unbeatable. Bonaventure, Davidson, VCU, um, beat them all, and then four one on SLU. So they're red hot going into the uh, the tournament. They do have a conference loss um, against Fordham, which was kind of an aberration, and two ties. So that's the reason they aren't the one seed and that they are the two seed behind George Mason. But really hot team playing very well right now. Um, so it, 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 like I said, like even even though uh, you know SLU hasn't lost in so long, I kind of felt like this was going to be that bucket of cold water. This is the best soccer the a10 has played in a long time yep um you've got two teams strong league yeah dayton and george mason are very very strong this year as much as it pains me to say it um but the flyers open up the scoring in this one with a clever little flick of a low cross in the 39th minute and took a one nil lead into halftime uh they made it 2-0 just 
two minutes and 40 seconds into the second half on, on a rocket from just outside the box. Then the third unreal uh, shot. Yeah. The third goal was an unfortunate own goal when Abinell somehow couldn't hang on to a corner out of the air and dropped it into his own net. I mean, that's just kind of the vibe that was, that was happening in this one. Uh, Dayton's last goal. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say Abinell was, he was good in this game, but that was, you know, I don't know. That mistake was just kind of out of nowhere. Uh, Dayton's last goal uh, came off a low, pretty cross uh, from outside the left side of the box, got through three Billiken defenders that just can't happen. Uh, found the foot of Ethan Sassine, who also scored their first goal. Uh, the Billikens got one back in the 72nd minute when Tanner Anderson finished off of Lawson Redmond and Draven Barnett assist. Uh, they almost made it 4-2 to two with about 16 minutes to play, but Dayton's keeper came up with a huge save off of Lara point-blank volley. Pete, run us down the stats in this one. Yeah, Slew got outshot by Dayton 20 to 8, 8 to 3 in shots on goal. Uh, corners worth 10 7 in Dayton's favor. They did commit six more fouls than the Billikens, but um, they were just the more aggressive team all over the pitch. So uh, it was worth it. Um, and, and like we said, with this loss, Slew slid from second place all the way down to sixth, Zach, as they head into the A 10 tournament. Uh, and the A-10 tournament, uh, the six-seed Billikens will head three-seed UMass on Saturday, November 9th for the quarterfinals. Uh, the Bills and the Minutemen did not meet in the regular season, and this will be their final meeting as conference mates. And I would imagine that will be a day game. Uh, yeah. George Mason got the one seed and will host number eight, LaSalle, on Friday. Uh, number two seed Dayton will host number seven seed Davidson also on Friday. Uh, the other Saturday game will be between number four Duquesne and number five Fordham in Pittsburgh. Uh, the bracket recedes dumb after the quarterfinals unless Davidson or LaSalle can pull off huge upsets. Billikens will not be playing another game at Herman this season. Pete Field Hockey, uh, their season finale did not go the way we had hoped. Uh, they no, drop a six no, one decision to lock Haven. Yeah, this was on Friday the first, uh, the season finale on the road. Um, the Bald Eagles struck just uh three minutes and fifteen seconds into the game. Um, uh, but Julia Ruyakers tied it just um 50 seconds later with her second goal of the season to make it 1-1. Uh, but it was all Lockhaven after that, Zach. They took a 3-1 lead into halftime after a scoreless second quarter. They added two more in the third and one more in the fourth. And I got to be honest, I didn't see this coming. Um, you know, Lockhaven was seventh in the league, just above SLU. And SLU's played everyone else pretty close, you know, in the league. Like, yes, they've lost, but they've been in it in most of these games. And and even against uh, St. Joe's, when they were just taking shot after shot after shot against them, they still didn't really give up that much. So, um I don't know. I did not see a blowout coming. Uh, it really surprised me. They did finish the season with 26 goals, which is tied with last season's total for most by a Billiken squad in more than 20 years. And it was the final game for seniors Josefina Perez, Savina Purawal, Pura uh, Julia Royakers, Anna Smith, and Olivia Smith. Combined, they've played in 288 matches in their uh, Billiken careers. Perez, in particular, really good player. Um, ended her SLU career with 25 goals, which is 10th all time in school history. And her her team leading 12 goals this season were the most by a Billiken since 1999. Um, so good good career, good season for her. But overall, it was a, it was a tough season for um, a lot of different reasons. Uh, you mentioned tough season, and uh... You know what? It's it's been a tough end of the season for uh, Billiken volleyball. Uh, I you know it's yeah not good. Uh, uh, three straight losses this week, and I I really you know I can sit here and read the stats, and again it it's interesting because you're looking at a a coaching staff that is very young, very inexperienced. And I think Chris May knew that. And you look at 
the only other coach on the staff that or on the athletic department staff that has a similar path. And that would be Katie Shields and Katie Shields took time. I mean, I think absolutely there is, there's a way this team can turn around. I think it's going to take, you know, getting again, getting better players, finding, finding that Mm. identity. You can't, you, Sometimes that first identity, like Katie Shields can attest to and has attested to on the show, it's sometimes it needs a little work. And right. I, I think it'll be interesting to see where they go from here. Um, they've got a lot of players to replace. And uh, But yeah, uh, start off with a 3-0 loss against Loyola on Tuesday the 29th. I really wanted them to take one game at home off Loyola. Uh, 1925, 24, 26, 1925. Bruce led slew with 11 kills. Delaney Rice had a 417 hitting percentage with 10 kills and no errors. Uh, Rogers, 13 digs. Lynn, 12 assists. Uh, 3 2 loss at George Washington on Friday the 1st, Pete. Yeah, in this one, um, slew got the first uh, set 25 19. Um, but then dropped the second one, 27-29, and 17-25 in the third, 25-23, they took the fourth, fourth and then lost the fifth, 8-15. to Error, Zach, were slew 36 and George Washington 22. Hitting percentage, slew was just .085 in this one compared to 239 for George Washington. And when you look at those two stats, the errors, the percentage, if either of those is halfway decent, slew wins this, right? I mean, they they were so close um, to pulling out a couple of those that they didn't. Bruce led them with uh, 19 kills. Rogers had five aces. Lynn had 24 assists. And unfortunately, Zach, they, they, they dropped the next one, 3-1 at George Washington on Saturday the 2nd. Yeah, 14, 25, 25, 21, 25, 27, and then 22, 25. Um, just a, a really brutal start. Uh, blown out right out of the gate in the first set. Uh, and then that, you know, that third set gets, that third set slips away. And um, yeah. that's really the match there. They had set point at 24, 22, or 24, 23. And then again at 25-24. Or sorry, 24-22, that's right. I kept thinking it was above 25 and I thought it was an error. Um, They ran out three straight points to take the lead 2-1. to 22 digs for Rodgers, six blocks for Luckett. Bruce had a double-double, 15 kills, 13 digs. Uh, Nine and 17 on the season, four and 10 in conference and battling for that final conference tournament spot. Uh, it's going to be a tough road to hoe. Uh, a huge gap between fifth place GW and the next team. SLU, George Mason, Duquesne are all 4-10. and 10. Uh, Next up, they'll host George Mason on Friday and Saturday, November 8th and 9th. They have to win both to even, uh, you know, get close to making the tournament. Uh, swimming and diving, Pete, real quick. Yeah, Saturday the 2nd against Bellarmine. The women won 124-93. The men, uh, 120-98. So each team won four individual events and both relays. And next up, they're going to be at the House of Champions at IUI on November 21st to 23rd. So they've got a couple weeks off here. Uh, Cross country. uh, A-10 championships were held November November 2nd in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Uh, finished sixth in the 8K. Manny Vela won the was the first Billiken across the line. Uh, 2447. Uh, good for 24, 21st place. George Blanco, 2441. Just behind him to finish 22nd. LaSalle runner McCallum Rowe won with a time of 2337 and broke the record for the fastest time in the A10 championship history. A record that stood for 39 years. They will be partying at the Gola Pool tonight. Uh, the women finished ninth in the 6K. Emery Mayfield, another freshman. Pace slew with a time of 21-19, 20th overall. Emily Morden finished 22nd with 21-21. Uh, the NCAA Midwest, Midwest Regionals are in Peoria on Friday, November 15th. And the NCAA Championships are in Madison, Wisconsin on Saturday, November 23rd. Those races will be cold. Uh, you know what's not cold? Moy Coffee, Pete. 
Uh, we've got a little update from our friend Farol Ahmed on kind of the nature of his business. Yeah, I just wanted to close it out with this because uh, we got yeah we got an email on the twenty eighth and I thought it was pretty um, pretty unique what he's doing here. The email was this. For those who don't know, we've been importing and selling green coffee to roasters across the country as well as roasting our own. Along the way, we realized that the coffee supply chain is broken, not just in Ethiopia, but globally. Farmers everywhere are being taken advantage of, and we saw this as a challenge we couldn't ignore. After months of work, we developed Moy.Coffee, a marketplace where North American roasters can buy coffee directly from farmers in coffee-growing countries, leading to a more streamlined supply chain eliminating the middleman and benefiting the farmers. This model will help us reach more farmers and make a bigger impact with the potential to reach farmers in every co coffee producing country in the world. We're fully shifting our business to this model. We'll continue roasting until Black Friday, and we deeply appreciate your support that has brought us to this point. Thank you and cheers, Farol. So um, yeah, just a heads up, if you want Farol's directly roasted beans, You've got just a few more weeks to get those through Black Friday, and uh, and I, I guess that'll be his last uh, his last batch. So probably will be available a little bit after that, but uh, but not much longer. We'll call it the end of the year. You're not really going to be seeing his stuff around anymore. Um, but it sounds pretty cool what he's doing with his business, Zach. Yeah, it does, and it'll definitely be a little less labor intensive, I think, for him. Yeah, and he's just you know, I mean, he's a, he's an entrepreneur. He saw a uh, a market. Um, uh, what's the word? Yeah, an for? opportunity. An opportunity, and he he took it, and yeah. uh, we'll see what this does. But it's always going to be onward and upward with that guy. He's really impressive. Yes, absolutely. That's going to do it for us on the Midtown Madness podcast. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, please subscribe on whatever platform you're you're currently using. Uh, thank you all for listening. Pete, go Bills. Thank you.